This program is brought to you by Emory University. With us today is the Honorable Jerry Bruce. Jerry Bruce is the juvenile court judge for the Inota Juvenile Court, Juvenile, excuse, the Inota Judicial Circuit is what I'm trying to get out. And that's in the far northeast corner of the state if you're not familiar. So there he's presiding all over all juvenile court matters in the counties of Lumpkin, Towns, Union, and White. So he is one of our circuit judges who has a lot of activity up in that area. Prior to his appointment on the bench, Judge Bruce served as a special assistant attorney general, a SAG representing DFAC, so has perspective from that on the ground level as well. And he previously held the position of the assistant district attorney for the Inota Judicial Circuit, which included an appointment as special drug prosecutor for felony drug crimes. He serves in a number of capacities with our Georgia Council on Juvenile Court judges that you can read more about. And he's a frequent presenter on topics of child welfare law. We've had him here for our summer program. He's presented at the child welfare attorney training at the state bar. I think also the youth law conference, perhaps. If not, we'll get you there. Um, and some national things as well. And so he's a graduate of the University of Georgia Law School, and he's also clerk for the um, Honorable Marvin Sorrells, who was at the time the chief judge of the Alcovey Judicial Circuit. So his bio and all the detail of his um, background is available again on your materials, along with PowerPoint presentations of his slides. Uh, judge Bruce's presentation today is about child hearsay. And with that, by way of introduction, please join me in welcoming Judge Bruce. Okay. All right. It may not be long enough to take a break. I don't know. We'll see. Thank you, Melissa, and thanks, everybody. Um, so I want to talk about child hearsay in Georgia today. And, you know, child hearsay is not really a riveting topic for a lot of people. If you work in child advocacy, it can be. Um, if you work in criminal law, it can be. But a lot of people don't really realize um, the full application of the child hearsay doctrines in those areas, outside of maybe the criminal area, where people sort of understand that it has a real... Uh, pertinence and a sort of abiding importance. But I think in the child welfare scenario, people don't really realize that as much because we tend to have quite a lot of informal hearings. We have a lot of hearings under our current and future juvenile codes uh, that allow uh, for um, a relaxation of the rules of evidence. So you have a lot of uh, your time spent in court dealing with uh, places where hearsay is allowable no matter what. And so there's not a lot of application for the child hearsay doctrine, perhaps. Although, when you start talking about deprivation trials and dependency trials after January 1 that are contested, and you're talking about terminations of parental rights that are contested, uh, you start looking more and more at the applicability of this doctrine. And I'll talk about that, because I think there's still some, there's some sort of scholarly disagreement, and there's disagreement in different jurisdictions about the applicability of something like uh, the child hearsay uh, exclusion in dependency cases and cases, other cases in juvenile courts. So talk about that. So, I want to start with some preliminary considerations to really address that. Why are we talking about child hearsay in a juvenile court context? And then, uh, if I remember correctly, we're going to move on to actually talk about the content of our statute itself. And I'll just go ahead and tell you that um, I'm referring to it as Rule 820. Uh, there's a shorthand for 24, 8, 820. I'm just going to say rule whatever because it's just so much easier and it sounds so much better. It takes less time and it still has a patina of newness about it that causes me to want to do it as much as I can. So we're going to talk about the actual content of Rule 820. And then um, we're going to talk about the Hatley versus State case that came out of the Georgia Supreme Court in 2012 and how that affected uh, the actual use uh, day in and day out of our child hearsay statute. And then, if you'll bear with me, um, I'd like to offer a sort of uh, critique of our current child hearsay statute uh, after Hatley and propose some ways forward. And since I'm going to be offering a critique, um, and uh, I'm in part brought here by uh, the Supreme Court Committee for Justice on Children, I'd just like to say that my critique is uh, my own opinion. It's not that of the Barton Center. It's not that of the Council of Juvenile Court Judges. Um, in fact, it may not be shared by anybody, but I hope that you'll see that at least I have some, some uh, demonstrable and explainable reasons for my critique of child hearsay as it stands in Georgia right now. So let's go on to preliminary considerations and talk about why are we talking about child hearsay statutes um, in juvenile court. First off, of course, we need to talk about the Sixth Amendment because the entire friction, and I'm sorry, I always drink coffee when I talk because... I just drink coffee when I talk, so or beer, and there's no beer here, so it's got to be coffee. Um, 
the entire friction between the applicability of hearsay exceptions in general and uh, the use of making proof at trial often comes down to, especially traditionally in the criminal context, the application of the Sixth Amendment. So the Sixth Amendment, of course, says that in all criminal proceedings, the accused has a right to, to be confronted with the witnesses against him. So everybody thinks immediately, well, okay, well, that's not, that's not juvenile court. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, delinquency cases, um, but I don't really see how it would apply elsewhere. And of course, it clearly does apply in delinquency cases. So right there, we have one application, a clear application of the need for a child hearsay statute to address issues of confrontation um, in delinquency cases. And that's uh, the old 1967 Galt case, which established this fact. So also, I think probably the clause would apply, let's look forward to after January, I think the clause will apply in Chin's cases because um, the SH case that I've cited in the materials says that uh, the clause applies anytime there's a possibility of a significant loss of liberty. And since any of the delinquency outcomes are on the table for most Chin's cases under the new code, then there's a possibility of a significant loss of liberty. And remember, loss of liberty doesn't just necessarily mean uh, being incarcerated. It can also mean having just restrictions placed on your liberty. I mean, the court has to make the same findings under our current and future codes. Um, whether we are placing a, a child in detention or whether we're placing a child on some sort of uh, restrictions like an ankle monitor or house arrest or something like that. We still have to make those findings by clear and convincing evidence that that curtailment of freedom is necessary, even at a detention hearing at an early stage in the proceeding. So we've got, I think, fairly clear applicability of confrontation clause issues in, um, in both Chin's cases and in delinquency cases. Also, though, there is uh, another rationale that I want to talk about. The, the Supreme Court of the, of the country has talked over and over again about a fundamental right to family integrity. And this is an ill-defined right. It's not fully fleshed out. It's not been uh, talked about in a real scholarly way. There's not been a lot of debate about its content. Um, the Supreme Court has sort of assumed its existence since the early part of the 20th century, since I think about 1915 or 1916, something like that, and has simply just, just assumed its existence since that time. And once one Supreme Court case says something exists, the other Supreme Court cases often don't go back behind that to try to figure out if it was correct or not. They often just say, well, we held here that this exists, and so now we held here this exists. Now you've got a century of holding that there is, in fact, a fundamental liberty interest of natural parents in the care, custody, and management of their children. Um, and this is something that's really important because even though it's not fully fleshed out by the, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of the United States, it raises some important issues. If, in fact, the right to family integrity, the right to uh, not have the, presume, the presumption that the state cannot come in and sort of take your family apart bit by bit and move your children around and take them away from you, if that implicates a liberty interest, then there's an argument that the Sixth Amendment or some comparable right to confrontation would apply because everywhere across the board that courts have begun to find the implication of liberty interests in other areas of law, they have begun to apply the same sorts of protections that are available in criminal cases because, of course, in a criminal case, your liberty is at stake. And if your liberty is at stake, whether it's uh, an interest against incarceration, the traditional liberty interest, or whether it's a for relatively newly found type of liberty interest, like a liberty interest in family integrity, then I think there's an argument uh, that some of the same uh, protections that would apply in a criminal case should apply here as well. In fact, um, fairly recently, the Supreme Court has said um, that this is one of our oldest fundamental liberty interests, which I thought was kind of funny because it seems to be a creation of the early 20th century and it's never really been fleshed out very much and it's not really found in the Constitution anywhere. But by the year 2000, the Supreme Court has said, look, it's here to stay. And if it's here to stay, then we need to start thinking about how we're going to apply protections for liberty interests in other contexts as well, contexts where family integrity is involved. 
So this is, a, this is an alternative argument. It's one that you may not hear made a lot, but it's something that you should be aware of because this jurisprudence is out there. This line of cases is relatively clear, although I think not very well explained. And uh, at some point, some Supreme Court justice or set of Supreme Court justices is going to dust them off, rediscover them, and want to talk about them. And when they do, um, it's useful to know what's going on in this area. And so I think that's an alternative reason that even outside of the delinquency uh, and outside of chins or other sort of status offense cases where traditional liberty interests are implicated, uh, we should start being aware that when family integrity becomes the uh, focus of our action in court and the government action is involved, then um, the same protection should apply as well. So that's an alternative argument. But while we're waiting for that to be fleshed out by the US Supreme Court and other courts, in the meantime, um, the state of Georgia has done us a favor. The, the appellate courts have held um, that there is a fundamental liberty interest and that because there's a fundamental liberty interest, there's a due process confrontation right. And that for purposes of appellate review, it's looked at in exactly the same way as the Sixth Amendment right to confrontation. So anytime, this, this is a, the uh, CWD case is a termination of parental rights case. So with that case coming out in 1998 in Georgia, there was a due process right um, announced in all termination of parental rights case that involves, uh, that requires uh, the same protections that the Sixth Amendment right and confrontation requires. So suddenly, we have a much more sophisticated sort of calculation to make in termination cases. And as of 1998, I'm sorry, as of 2008, this holding was explicitly extended to what were then called deprivation cases and will go on to be applied to, to uh, dependency cases as well after the first of the year. So right now in Georgia, we have a due process right to confrontation. And a lot of people just aren't aware, aware of that. So in deprivation, dependency cases, um, and in termination of parental rights cases, the same calculation for um, confrontation against witnesses applies as it does in a criminal case, or in a delinquency case, or in some other case where traditional liberty interests are at stake. So that's why we need to talk about the child hearsay statute because the child hearsay statute affects or implicates the right to confrontation and it's clearly something that needs to be talked about in our context in juvenile courts. So let's talk about Rule 820. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about, um, about the problems of Rule 820 and I want to just give a sort of foretaste of that there. Rule 820 is extremely clear. A statement made by a child under the age of 14 years describing any act of sexual contact or physical abuse performed by or on the child, with or on the child, by another, shall be admissible in evidence by the testimony of the person to whom it was made, to whom made, if the child is available to testify in the proceeding and the court finds that circumstantial, uh, that circumstances of the statement provide sufficient indicia of reliability. This is exactly the same rule that we had under our old evidence code, 24-3-16, except that um, in 24-3-16, there was the phrase, um, or performed with or on another in the presence of the child. So it allowed for statements about sexual contact or physical abuse performed with or on the child by another, or performed with or on another in the presence of the child. And as many of you are probably aware, in the Woodard versus the state case in 1998, the Georgia Supreme Court said that's a violation of equal protection. There's no rational basis for, uh, for protecting this one class of statement as opposed to the other. Um, so we're only going to protect those by this child, something done to the child, not something done in the presence of the child. That's, a, that's an irrational um, bifurcation of the right. And then in, um, in 2012, Bunn versus the state, the state Supreme Court said that Woodard was irrationally decided or in incorrectly decided and said that that actually was a fine rule and it can go back into place. Unfortunately, the legislature had already taken that language out uh, for the new 2013 evidence code. So the new 2013 evidence code comes without it, although the Georgia Supreme Court in the Bunn case specifically approved its reinsertion by the legislature. So just, that's something to be aware of. Um, right now, um, the child cannot testify to things done to someone else in the child's presence. But that was formerly the case, and it may be the case again in the near future. 
Um, so I would look for that. So let's analyze um, what statements are covered first. I just want to break this statute apart because it's sort of wordy, and I'd like to tear it down into some constituent parts. First, the age of the child. The child has to be under the age of 14, and this is fairly clear and self-explanatory. And also, the act that's described is any act of sexual contact or physical abuse, unless the code is amended to, um, to um, reinstate the language that Woodard declared unconstitutional, then currently this would rule out the use of the child hearsay statute uh, to cover statements about domestic violence witnessed or heard by the child. But any other type of sexual contact or physical abuse that is performed with or on the child. And the fact that it's performed with or on the child also shows that the consent, there's no element of consent or willing participation of the child. It's completely immaterial whether the child consents to this, whether the child uh, participates in the activity or not, and that's consistent with Georgia law making the age of consent 16. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about um, the child turns 15 right before the adjudicatory. Right before the what? The adjudication. Right. Does that make a difference? If the child turns 16 at the time of the adjudication? 15, 15 at the time of the adjudication? Um, this is um, a statement that is, if the child has to be 14 at the time the statement that is sought to be introduced at the trial was made. Even so it doesn't, if the child turns 15. The child may be older than that at the time. The statement, this is the analysis is made at the time, the child's age at the time the statement was made not at the time the statement sought to be introduced. So it may take, you know, two, three years for a case to wind through, especially a criminal case, to wind through the system and come to trial. Uh, but if that child made an outcry at the age of 14 or younger, um, I'm sorry, under the age of 14, then that case is, that statement is going to be applicable, even if the child is 16 when the case comes to trial. And the perpetrator can be any other person at all. That's a child, an adult, anyone, anyone whatsoever. So if a child under the age of 14, I will note that several states have begun uh, moves to amend their statute to make um, the age 16, under the age of 16. And Florida, I think, has a new statute, an amendment to its statute, which is supposed to take effect in January, which either makes it uh, 16 or under or under 16. So there's been a move on to move this age limit up a little bit, which is something to be aware of as well. So we talked about the statement. Now let's talk about the criteria for the admissibility of this statement. When, when can you use these statements and how? Um, and actually, not the admissibility of the statement. I'm sorry, we're still talking about the, the origin of the statement here. So what's the testimony? Um, no, I'm sorry, I haven't had enough coffee today. We're up to the uh, using the testimony. Um, at trial. The, this testimony uh, is the person to whom the statement is made, okay? The person to whom the statement is made, which is also very clear. That's usually a parent. Sometimes it's a foster parent. It can be a teacher. It can be a social worker. It can be a law enforcement official. The only requirement is that this person has spoke directly with the child. I can only find one case that provided a clear exception to that rule and it was one in which the child was aware that a law enforcement officer was going to be watching a uh, forensic evaluation from outside the room behind a one-way mirror, um, a two-way mirror, I guess they are, behind a mirror, and was aware that that person was there before the interview started. And so that person was allowed to testify to the statement, even though that person wasn't technically the person to whom the statement was made. But generally, the law has been very consistent in requiring the testimony of the person to whom the statement was made. We're going to come back and talk later a lot about this aspect of our code, the requirement of availability. Um, but for now, suffice it to say that the, the statutory textual requirement is that the child be available to testify. Yes, ma'am. Just for clarification, the example that you're giving, so the child was aware that the police officer was behind the glass? Yes. Okay, so then it would apply to the police manager or anything like that. Right. 
he was aware before the interview started that you know investigator brown or whoever was going to go out of the room and uh, listen to this interview behind the glass So we'll unpack this issue of, of availability in a minute. So hold that. We'll come back to that one. And then there is a requirement for reliability, of course, because that's a requirement that we have to make in every single hearsay determination. I mean, that's what hearsay is. It is a type of statement that would normally not be admissible, except that there are a certain indicia of reliability. Maybe there are circumstances under which the statement was made that make it more reliable. Maybe it's the type of statement that's made routinely. I mean, we'll talk about those things a little bit later. But the court has to, even if everything else is met, find that the circumstances of the statement provide sufficient indicia of reliability. Um, it's also important, I think, at this point to note that trial courts have a number of tools at their disposal to protect child witnesses. And we'll talk about some of those a little bit later. But you can certainly um, find in the case law approval, both in the federal and state level, for um, placing the alleged offender or the child in a different room and allowing testimony to be um, videotaped uh, or with a live feed um, either so that both the child and the accused can see one another or so that it's only one way so that the accused can see the child as long as everyone has an opportunity to consult with counsel during this type of proceeding. So in fact, that was uh, the, the uh, gravamen of part of the BH case that extended the holding of um, the confrontation right to deprivation cases. One of the issues in that case was whether or not it was appropriate for the juvenile court to allow uh, the child to sit in another room in the courthouse and be seen by the defendant on a monitor in the courtroom, seen and heard, but the child was not able to see or hear the uh, parent who was alleged to have molested the child. And the uh, Georgia court said that that was perfectly all right under our current statutory scheme. So I said we'd come back and talk about availability. Um, and we'll talk about availability even after we get finished talking about availability here. We'll come and talk about it when we get to the sort of critique part. But for now, availability certainly means, at a threshold, competence to testify. Um, you know, if you have someone who is just absolutely unable to testify uh, because of competence problems, they may be, that person may be, unavailable to testify. However, Georgia has really loosened up with the adoption of our current evidentiary code um, the requirements for competency. Um, basically now, um, all children are considered available to testify um, if they are competent to testify, but, oh, there's your feedback, but all children in deprivation proceedings and in all criminal proceedings in which there's a child victim or witness are competent to testify. So uh, now there's really no restriction on child competence. And the fact that someone alleges that a child is incompetent to testify uh, does not necessarily make that testimony inadmissible. Now it goes to the weight and credibility of that testimony rather than to its admissibility. One of the um, commentaries on the, uh, on the analogous federal rule, Rule 807, um, noted that a witness wholly without any capacity is difficult to imagine. So even the most impaired witnesses may have trustworthy testimony that they can give in one way or another, and courts should be open to that and then allow the parties to talk about what weight and credibility should be given to that. So there's really no bar for age any longer in Georgia. There's no statutory requirement that a child be a certain age to testify. Uh, this is a case-by-case -case consideration. But all children who are victims or are witnesses of crimes are competent to testify and their testimony is a credibility issue. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So those are the major portions of our statute. We've talked a little bit about what kind of statement the child makes, to whom the child can make the statement, what's the content of the statement, and then who can testify about that statement, and about um, what availability means. And we'll come back again to availability in a minute. So that, that was the status of our jurisprudence with the exception of a few tweaks that came in under our new evidence code in 2013. That was the status of our jurisprudence on child hearsay at the point at which the Georgia Supreme Court considered the case in Hatley versus the state, which is a 2012 case. Hatley was a, was a case um, in which a uh, mother 
And this is, if you work in juvenile court or in criminal law, this scenario is so familiar, it's sort of depressingly familiar. So a mother and her small children, very small children, like three years old, that sort of age range, really tiny children, were outside homeless on a really cold night. I don't remember where in Georgia this happened, uh, but um, a guy that the mother had seen once before came by and said, hey, let me put everybody up in a hotel room with me. And the mother thought this was a really good idea. And uh, so they went to the hotel room together. And then, in order to really show her stellar parenting skills, she left her small infant children alone with this guy that she had seen once before while she went to the store to buy a bottle, I think, for the baby or something like that. So she came back to the hotel room after some time had lapsed to find um, her three-year-old daughter on the bed with her pants pulled down and uh, Hatley over the daughter, uh, sort of crouched over her on the bed. And um, the, daughter, the mother immediately you know, cried out, what is going on here? And uh, Hatley said, well, I'm trying to help her pull her pants up. And he, the mother said, so why are you on top of my daughter on the bed? And he had no immediately good explanation. Um, the daughter, the three-year-old daughter, said um, something to the effect of, Mama, he sucked me, right then and there. Uh, sort of a spontaneous type of utterance, if you will. And the mother then uh, attempted to call 911, and Hatley hung up the phone. And so police responded to the 911 hang up. In the meantime, the daughter gave a little bit more information to the mother. The police arrived. They didn't know what was going on. Hatley was still in the room with the family. And they asked what had happened, and the mother said, here's what my daughter told me. Here's what was going on. Hatley said, oh, yeah, the, uh, she, fell in the, she fell in the commode, and I was helping her get, um, you know, get, uh, get cleaned up after that. At trial, it turned out that the state had evidence that there was uh, Hatley's saliva on the girl's pubic area. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot I had dumped half a cup of my own saliva in the toilet immediately before dropping the girl in there. I mean, human ingenuity just knows no ends. I mean, this was his defense at trial. Um, so there was the statement that the child made to the mother, the, out, the immediate outcry when the mother walked in. Um, there, was some, there was some conversation between the mother, the child, and the police officer while the officers attempted to sort of find out what was going on, um, during which the child elaborated and gave some more information, which is even worse than the stuff I've already relayed to you. And then after several months, or well, I forget how long, but after a significant lapse of time, the child spoke to a forensic interviewer where the child gave statements that were materially the same as those the child had given the night of the incident. So these uh, statements were all introduced against Hatley over his objection at trial, and he was convicted, and he appealed. And uh, many of you may be aware of Crawford versus Washington, the Supreme Court case, and I think the citation for Crawford versus Washington is in the materials. If it's not, I can send that out to you. Um, in the meantime, so Crawford versus Washington um, had been decided in the mid 2000s, and this was the first real chance of the Georgia Supreme Court to do a, a really down and dirty review of our child hearsay statute after Crawford. And the Supreme Court looked at Crawford and looked at the at the child hearsay statute and found that uh, its constitutionality could be saved, but only by appending on some novel, to Georgia anyway, procedures and requirements to, um, to the child hearsay statute. So it's kind of like you know, taking somebody and saving their life by turning them into a cyborg, maybe. You, know? you can save them, but the question is, are they still the same afterwards as they were before? We'll talk about that later. So here's the requirement. The requirement after Hatley is that Rule 820 requires the prosecution, and remember that they're, they're speaking about a criminal case, but if, a, there's a, if there is a uh, due process right to confrontation in a dependency case, in a TPR case, then the prosecutor is going to be the SAG as well. So even though this is couched in traditional criminal law language, the requirements are going to apply in dependency and TPR cases as well. The prosecutor has to notify the defendant within a reasonable period of time prior to trial of his intent to introduce this pretrial hearsay statement of the child and to give the uh, defendant an opportunity to object, to review it and to object, to raise a confrontation clause objection. If the defendant objects, then the prosecution must call the child to put the child on the stand to testify at trial. If they do not, they can't use the pretrial statement at all under most cases. We'll talk about the finessing of that in just a minute. Um, if 
the defendant does not object, then the child can testify, I'm sorry, the hearsay statements can be put in subject once again to the trial courts making a determination, a threshold gatekeeping determination that there are sufficient indicia of reliability to allow their use. So that's, you know, the, the new requirement, you know, word for word is as long as the existing statute. That's one thing that's kind of interesting. Um, so our statute has effectively been doubled in, in textual length by the Supreme Court by appending these procedures in order to save the statute. Um, and um, we'll unpack this as we go forward. But the first thing we need to wear, be aware of is that in making this determination about hearsay, um, the Hatley Court did two things. First off, this providing a sufficient indicia of reliability, which is already in the statute, that's the language from the, the Ohio versus Roberts case, which I think is also cited in the, um, in the materials. That was the pre-Crawford rule um, on how to admit these types of hearsay statement. They had to have sufficient indicia of reliability. Um, there was an argument about whether that requirement survives for certain still admissible child hearsay after Crawford, um, and our state certainly seems to believe that that's the case. So there still needs to be this gatekeeping decision made by the court uh, if the court allows the, the evidence to come in because the defendant hasn't objected to it. The other thing that the Supreme Court did in Georgia was to incorporate um, another Supreme Court precedent. The Supreme Court in Crawford versus Washington had talked about the difference between testimonial and non-testimonial hearsay. And I'm always surprised when I talk about this that a lot of people are not aware of this distinction because it's extremely important. And it was further elucidated by the US Supreme Court in Davis versus Washington, which I believe is also in the materials. And again, if I cite a case that's not in the materials, let me know and I can provide citations. So Davis versus Washington had said, well, there's two types of, of hearsay that might come in that, that will implicate the uh, confrontation clause. There's testimonial hearsay, and there's non-testimonial hearsay. And um, the, the major difference, this is the uh, Georgia Supreme Court quoting the Davis Court, is that non-testimonial hearsay uh, comes in um, when the police are investigating and their primary purpose is to meet an ongoing emergency. So this is what was called the primary purpose test. So how do you tell if something's testimonial or non-testimonial? You look at the purpose, the purpose under which this, uh, the purpose uh, for which these statements were made. Were they made to police who were responding to an ongoing emergency? If so, they're non-testimonial. If they were made um, in order to prepare for litigation, to gather evidence, to prepare charges against somebody in criminal or other proceedings, then they are testimonial. And there's gonna be a major difference for courts using this information depending on whether they find that the hearsay offered was testimonial or non-testimonial. Another, um, there have been a lot of questions about whose point of view do you use when deciding if something is testimonial or non-testimonial? Is it the the, the point of view of the officer, perhaps, asking the question, or the parent asking the question, or the 911 operator asking the question? Is it the point of view of the declarant? And there was some Supreme Court uh, dicta that indicated that it was really from the declarant's point of view. Um, in 2011, in Michigan against Bryant, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court gave us this, and this is, this is kind of wordy, and it's, a, it's a, a lot of stuff on one side, but it's really important. It points out that the analysis is supposed to be an objective, analysis of the entire circumstances of the encounter. Um, everything, that the statements and actions by all the parties to this encounter in order to provide an accurate assessment of the primary purpose. And one of the most important things that uh, the, the court pointed out in Bryant is that the relevant inquiry is not the subjective or actual purpose of the individuals involved. That's not the inquiry. Why you subjectively made the statement is not important for our confrontation clause analysis, but just objectively, looking at it from a reasonable person standard, why would a reasonable participant uh, have believed the statement was made, given all the facts and circumstances? So this is kind of a nuanced test. It may not be the easiest sort of test to apply, but in order to, um, 
gives some idea of its application, we can talk about how the Supreme Court of Georgia in the Hatley case actually applied that test. So we had three main statements by the child. There was this initial statement to the mother. The mother walked in, saw what was happening, said something, the, the transcript that the court used says expletive, and then um, asked the child what was going on. The child made this statement. And the Supreme Court of Georgia said, well, this is clearly non-testimonial by every fact and circumstance. This was made to answer an, an, an immediate and necessary question. Nobody was trying to gather evidence for prosecution. Nobody was trying to, there was a, a need to meet an ongoing emergency. So, so that's a very good example of why this is an objective test. You might think that the only people that can meet an ongoing emergency are law enforcement officers or 911 call people, but it, anyone who believes objectively, who, who under the objective circumstances should believe that there's responding to an ongoing emergency, whether it's public safety or the safety of one person, the safety of a child to the parent, anything like that. So this statement to the mother is non-testimonial. The initial statement to the police, the Supreme Court punted on, saying that it could not be categorized easily because the moment when the police neutralized any threat to the public is unclear. They, they allowed it anyway because they said there was such overwhelming evidence of Hatley's guilt. Um, I guess the saliva defense is not a really good defense. Um, I mean, who keeps a half a cup of saliva around? I just don't get that. I mean, I don't even know how long it would take to amass half a cup of saliva. It seems like that's a lot, you know, I don't know. But, um, so they couldn't really say. They said, well, this is, this is so fact intensive and we don't have enough information because we don't know exactly when the police neutralized the threat. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a gray area. Those initial statements to the police, which contain more information the child gave to the mother, could be non-testimonial based on the totality of the circumstances or could be testimonial, but the Supreme Court or any fact finder would need more information about what was going on. You can't look at the totality of the circumstances if you don't have the totality of the circumstances. And then finally, the statements well after the fact to the forensic interviewer were testimonial because the only reason the child was talking to the forensic interviewer was to establish a case, to build up evidence, to find out what had happened and to find out if there was going to be a referral to law enforcement or not. So I think this is actually a sort of useful exercise because it, it gives a clear real world um, test of how to use the difference between testimonial and non-testimonial hearsay. And the point of all this is that the use of non-testimonial hearsay at trial is not a violation of the confrontation clause. Yes? Has this analysis been made um, on a DFACS child protective services case manager? Not by the Georgia Supreme Court, not that I've seen. No. I don't know what the Court of Appeals is doing. But I haven't seen a case where this point-by-point -point analysis has been applied in a deprivation case, for instance. Um, but I imagine it would be very closely similar. I mean, in a case like this, you know, you can imagine a deprivation case perhaps coming out of this. I don't know, but you could maybe see that, in which case then you'd have a juvenile court as well as a superior court considering these things um, in their respective forums. So, but the important point to take away is you don't have to worry about any confrontation clause issue when you're dealing with non-testimonial hearsay. There may be other issues that go to their weight and credibility or the court may decide not to admit them for other reasons, but they are not subject to a confrontation clause challenge. Yes, ma'am. No, it only applies to testimonial hearsay. <clears throat> right. Yeah, like in this case, you would have had to have the mom testify um, what the child told her. Yeah, well, um, the, Crawf the, uh, Crawford, um, the Crawford court, I think it was excited utterance that the U.S. Supreme Court in, in Crawford warned against the use of. But excited utterance is still a live, a live um, exception to the hearsay rule. And it's certainly true that there may be other ways to get in some of this evidence. Um, rather than characterizing them as child hearsay, you might say, well, this just comes in as an excited utterance if it meets all the requirements. Um, in the past, uh, many parties have used statements for medical diagnosis 
to get these sorts of things in. Well, the child went to the doctor and did this, in which case I think the question is going to be, you know, well, what's the doctor doing? Is the doctor really trying to, to treat this child now and make a determination in order to administer first aid, perhaps, or, or treatment nearly after the, uh, quickly in time after the event? Or is this way down the road later and it's more of a routine sort of thing and the doctor's going to turn over his notes because he's a mandated reporter and, you know, things like that. So all of those things are going to come into play. But it's certainly true that other hearsay exceptions may apply to these statements as well. Yes. Grandfather, I have not had any food all weekend. Well, I've not been fed all week. Well, you'd have to ask yourself first. It's it's not a it's not a statement of of sexual contact, is it? You'd have to ask yourself whether that's a statement of physical abuse or not. And it's pretty arguable, I think, um, whether that's a statement of physical abuse. Um, and I guess. You know, my, my first off-the-cuff reaction would depend, say it would depend probably on how long the child had been without food as to whether it was physical abuse. So I don't know. I don't know. But you certainly make an argument that if you withhold child, uh, food from a child for an entire weekend, that could amount to physical abuse. But that's going to be for the fact finder. If it doesn't amount to physical abuse, then it's not going to come in as a child hearsay statement, although it may come in in some other way. All right, so we've talked about Rule 820 as it stands right now. This is, this is where we are today in our jurisprudence on child hearsay in Georgia. Um, we have a requirement uh, by the Supreme Court of Georgia that in order to meet uh, the due process, um, uh, I'm sorry, the requirements of the Sixth Amendment in criminal cases, and I'm going to argue due process requirements in other types of cases, we have certain procedures that we now have to follow in order to get child hearsay in. It has to be tendered to the other side, the opposing side, the, whoever that is, the side against whom the statement is going to be offered in advance of its use. No hard and fast rules about how long that is, but simply sufficiently in advance of trial to allow them to have time to review the statement and make a determination whether there's going to be an objection made. And then if they object, that child is going to have to take the stand. And there's no other way around it. And if they do not object, that statement may come in um, if uh, there are significant indicia of reliability. And this is all, we're talking about testimonial hearsay. Non-testimonial is another calculation altogether. But for testimonial hearsay, which, which is probably um, a large portion of the type of hearsay that is sought to be introduced both in criminal trials and in child welfare trials. You have statements to defax workers. You have statements to doctors. You have statements to uh, police officers. You have forensic interviews, lots of forensic interviews, um, where I come from anyway. Yes? Why would you say that if you want to use a statement using a child welfare hearsay statute, but if the defendant objects, you have to put the kid on the stand? Like yes. There's no other way around it? Yes. So essentially, the statute has been killed. Well, that's what I want to argue. Yeah, let's go. That's a that's a good segue to uh, to critique and considerations at this point. So, what if I told you that the child hearsay statute isn't a child hearsay statute as it now stands? This is what I really think. Again, this is nobody's opinion but my own. So, but in order to talk about this, let's start by talking about what, what's a child hearsay except, well, what's a hearsay exception? Not just a child hearsay exception, what's a hearsay exception? So I think the best way to approach this is from a sort of practical practitioner's standpoint. What happens when a hearsay objection is made in actual practice? Right? So you have your trial is moving along. And we're assuming we have a trial where the rules of evidence apply, if you're talking about an adjudicatory hearing or um, you know, a delinquency trial, something like that where the rules of evidence apply, and you have somebody say, you know, well, the child told me, and someone says, objection, hearsay. What happens after that? Well, it might get rephrased. But what if it doesn't get rephrased? What is the proponent of that testimony then usually do? 
yeah, I mean, you, you tell the court, well, sure, it's hearsay. But here's why it gets to come in anyway, because it falls under some recognized exception to the hearsay rule. I mean, I guess there are certain circumstances in which they may argue that it's not hearsay, because there are some things that, are except, that might look like hearsay that are excluded from being hearsay by our statute. But for the most part, you're going to get an objection, and you're going to say, Judge, this is going to come in because of some exception to the hearsay rule. And then your fact finder, your judge, is going to weigh those considerations, right? And he's either going to say, all right, it's not going to come in, bless you, because it doesn't fit an exception, or it is going to come in because it does fit an exception, right? I mean, that's the way this happens. So the ruling on a hearsay objection is basically a determination by the court as to whether hearsay that's been offered is admissible over objection because it falls within some recognized exception. I mean, that's what happens every time we deal with hearsay in a courtroom. Doesn't matter what kind of courtroom it is. If there's an objection to hearsay now, the court has to make a determination about whether this gets in somehow, even though it's hearsay. Well, let's look at the Georgia procedure under our Rule 820 now. Hearsay is offered. The other side against whom it's offered says, objection. Well, it's over at that point. Right? It's over. There's no determination made by the courts of whether this falls under some exception to hearsay or not. It's just over. It doesn't come in. And the immediate effect of Hadley is to remove 820 from the category of hearsay exceptions. It's not a hearsay exception, because if it's a hearsay exception, then the court has to have the opportunity to say, how does this fit? And if it does fit, we're going to use it, because that's what you do with hearsay exceptions, right? You use them. I mean, some people argue that we use them so much that the, the exceptions have swallowed the rule, that there's so many exceptions. But that's what you do. You use hearsay exceptions over objection. But now, what we have is it doesn't come in if there's an objection. So I would argue that it's not really a hearsay exception any longer because it doesn't look like a hearsay exception. No one acts in court as if it's a hearsay exception. And I think what it is right now is a rule that allows stipulated testimony to come in. So look, if the two parties agree that this child's statement comes in, it comes in. And if they don't agree, it doesn't come in, at least as hearsay, unless that child gets on the stand and testifies. So basically what 820 allows us to do now is to stipulate to the child's testimony or not. And my question about that is, why do we need a rule for that? We already do that anyway. If the parties stipulate to the admission of evidence, then most of the time that evidence is going to come in because it's been stipulated to by the parties. I mean, we're there to resolve controversies. And for the most part, if there's no controversy, the parties say, yeah, we, we agree on this part. Let's move on to the thing we disagree about. Then it comes in. If the parties stipulate to someone's testimony, then the testimony comes in. This is not a hearsay objection. It's not a hearsay exception any longer. Also, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Under Hatley, if there's no objection to the statement, the, uh, the statute says the state can introduce the, the child victim, I'm sorry, the court says the state can introduce the child victim's hearsay statement subject to the trial court's determination that uh, the statements provide sufficient indice of reliability, right? So let's say there's no objection court has to make a gatekeeping determination about whether there are sufficient indicia of reliability. Again, this is just this hearsay reliability test from Ohio versus Roberts. Whenever you're dealing with hearsay, you have to make sure that it fits some, ex some exception and that it's somehow reliable because of that, either because of the exception itself, like a business record, or because uh, other circumstances make it reliable. But under our current evidence code, under Rule 802, if hearsay testimony is not objected to, it comes in. And not only does it come in, but the code says it shall be legal evidence and admissible. So what happens now when you have, we have a conflict in our, in our law? I think an unnecessary conflict in our law, but we have a conflict in our law now because if you're attempting to introduce a child hearsay Statue, uh, uh, a child hearsay statement, and there's no objection to it, 
is the answer that, well, this is a hearsay statement that's attempted to be put in. It's not been objected to, so it's legal evidence and admissible. Or does the court have to, does the court still have the opportunity to leave it out? So 802 says it's admissible. And the Hatley court says, well, it might be admissible if the court decides that it meets circumstances of reliability, indicia of reliability. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, I, I, I think there's a really good argument um, that we should be talking about Rule 802 instead because Rule 802, even though it was on the table and had been foreseen and was already drafted at the time the Hatley court made its decision, was not law. And it became law after the fact. It's a superseding requirement. So I'd love somebody to make this argument um, in court and have it taken up on appeal so they can get the answer to this question. This is another, this is another practical Hatley problem. Um, there's an ambiguity. We don't know if this is something the judge gets to decide or if it's automatically admissible. So that's another problem. Not only is our current scheme not a hearsay exception, a stipulated, stipulated testimony statute, it also is unclear in its actual application, even when there's no objection. So I'd like to offer then um, a way forward, which is not really imaginative, it's very clear, and that is the use of Rule 807, which is a federal um, rule that is largely in the Georgia Rule 807. We'll talk about the differences called the residual exception. And basically it says, you know, if you've got a statement, a hearsay statement that's not covered by either of the two major sets of hearsay exceptions, that's Rule 803 and 804, both in the federal code and in Georgia, but it has equivalent circumstantial guarantees of trustworthiness. It's not excluded by the hearsay rule if it's offered as evidence of a material fact. It's more probative than otherwise and the general purposes of these rules and of justice would best be served by admission of the statement. Um, however, the statement can't be admitted unless there's pretrial notice of the intention to admit it, an opportunity um, for the other side to look into this statement and to, uh, to meet that evidence, including the name and address of the declarant. And this is how, in the federal regime, this is how a lot of child hearsay gets admitted. It still gets admitted as excited utterances sometimes. It still gets admitted um, as uh, statements to medical personnel, although I think less and less frequently in the federal cases. Um, the residual statute is one of the most important ways that child hearsay evidence is dealt with in federal courts. And you'll notice that it provides, on a statutory basis, the sort of procedural guarantees that the Hatley Court has tacked on to our statute, except that it still allows for the statement to really be treated like hearsay. I want to offer this statement, you object to the statement, and I'm going to argue why it fits this exception. And if the judge says, yeah, it fits the exception, it's coming in, as long as we've met these pretrial notice requirements. And if it doesn't fit the exception, it's not coming in. So it looks a lot like hearsay at this point. It looks like a hearsay exception. In fact, it is a hearsay exception. So um, I'd like to talk about some things specifically that Georgia could do to remedy the current situation and to move forward. First would be, I think, to delete the requirement of availability. our rule. And I'm sorry, there's a typo there. That should be 820. Delete the requirement of availability in our rule 820. That would be a step in the right direction, getting rid of the availability requirement. I think, I think the availability requirement is the problem that started everything that I've sort of been complaining about this afternoon, or that I hope I've been reasonably pointing out. Think about this for a minute. Rule 803 and Rule 804 in the federal code and in the Georgia statute now contain the classic hearsay exceptions, right? And does anybody know off the top of your head what the difference is between 803 and 804 exceptions? 
Sorry? One or non hearsay purposes of other sources? Not exactly. Availability, availability. Yeah, the availability, right? So 803 are those things where the availability of the declarant is immaterial. It doesn't matter whether the person is there to testify at trial or not, because those 803 exceptions are the kind of exceptions that are so routine on the one hand, like business records and things like that, or so novel and shocking on the other hand, um, that uh, we don't suspect normally that there's been opportunity and intention to fabricate. We say, well, the circumstances under which these are made are lend such reliability to the testimony that making the real person come and sit in court is not going to add to it. Okay, Because by the time the person gets on the stand in court, he has had an opportunity to think about it and to fabricate. But at, when it was made, when those statements were made, the circumstances were such that it just doesn't seem reasonable that there's been fabrication. Of course, there's exceptions, but that's why we have the 803 exceptions. Because those are ones for which the actual live testimony of the declarant doesn't add anything to the calculation. And then we have 804 exceptions, which are, well, essentially saying, look, we'd rather have the declarant come and testify. So it's best to have the declarant come and testify. But for these limited exceptions, if the declarant is unavailable, if you cannot get the declarant, the declarant is unavailable, then we'll allow this hearsay to come in, these specific exceptions under 804. But you'll notice there's no traditional hearsay requirement for which um, a criteria is the availability of the declarant. I mean, if the declarant's available, traditionally, you don't need a hearsay exception because the declarant's there. So, you know, I, I don't know what went into the sort of making of Rule 820 in our old code and why it was imported whole hog into the new code. But the fact that it makes availability a requirement, I think, brings it in with a conceptual contradiction. It's very hard to identify uh, the necessity for having an availability requirement in a hearsay exception. It's never been the way that hearsay exceptions have been looked at by courts in the past. Either the availability is immaterial or they're unavailable. In fact, unavailability uh, may be one of the strongest reasons for some hearsay admission. Because you just can't get the person in the interest of justice dictate that the statement come in and it was made under circumstances which are reliable enough so that you don't need the live body on the stand. One of the strongest reasons for bringing in hearsay, I think, is unavailability. So if we were to, if we were to get rid of our availability requirement, this would open up to us several avenues for the introduction of child hearsay that are available to people in certain other jurisdictions and in the federal courts. First of all, what happens if you have a child who by the time the case comes around to trial uh, doesn't, um, is this the not remember? Yeah, doesn't remember anymore. This is very common in child cases. I mean, think about the Hatley case. This is something that happened when this child was three years old. And I don't know how long it took off the top of my head for that case to go to trial, but it probably wasn't, you know, 12 months. I mean, maybe it was, but it probably wasn't. But think about a three-year-old child. I mean, you know, a few months is like a lifetime. By the time the child comes to the stand, well, the child can't remember anymore. Well, if you have a if you have a uh, 807 residual exception, you ask yourself, all right, is this child unavailable? Yeah, the child's unavailable, basically, to us as a witness. That we can't get the testimony from the child because the child doesn't remember anymore. So, Judge, there are other indicia of reliability. We've given pretrial notice to the other side about trying to get this statement in. And so when they object, you make a decision about whether this, this, these indicia of reliability are enough to get us to the fact finder, to the jury, or in a bench trial so that you can consider them when it comes time to make the adjudication. It would allow um, for specific findings that testimony would cause undue trauma to the child. There's an entire body of work in the federal system on the phenomenon of psychological unavailability, which is the idea that reliving a traumatic experience can by itself be so traumatic that the child has more trauma responses. And add to that, reliving that trauma experience in a courtroom with, you know, 
perhaps jurors and court reporters and people sitting there watching and the person who inflicted the trauma sitting, you know, four feet away, looking the child in the eye perhaps in the most sort of raw circumstances where there's no other protections that have been offered to the child, that this is simply too much, too much danger to the child, too much trauma to the child. And the federal courts have said, yeah, we understand that. And in those cases, if the child just can't testify, it would re-traumatize the child because the state has a compelling interest in protecting child victims as well as in protecting the rights of an accused. And so those things could be balanced under Rule 807, but this is not something that's available to us in Georgia. If a child is psychologically unavailable, then it doesn't meet the statute, which requires availability. Also, what about refusals to testify? Sometimes kids get on the stand and they just don't cooperate. They will not say what they're supposed to say. And sometimes that's because they're afraid. Sometimes it's because uh, they may feel like they're going to get in trouble for admitting it, especially in a formal circumstance. They may be afraid of the defendant, the other party, whoever it is. In California versus Green, it was, a, it was an instance of a guy, a kid who was a party to a crime, I think, and he was just, he was refused to talk about what happened uh, to the adult in the case because he seemed to be afraid of, the, of that child. And the Supreme Court said, look, the state did all they could to get that child's testimony. They put that child on the stand, and the child was remarkably evasive. And by the way, if you're interested in confrontation clause, um, meditations. You can read Justice Harlan's dissent in California versus Green, which is a great, it is a wonderful, it's like a meditation on the Confrontation Clause and its history. So if you're interested in that, I ask you to look at that. And then you can look at, uh, at some of Justice Scalia's recent writings and balance those together and get a fairly well-rounded picture of two sides of the debate about what the Confrontation Clause should mean in our country, because it's still a live debate depending on what particular majority shows up on the Supreme Court at any given time. But so these are things that are, that are realities that we look at all the time in court, but which are not, no pun intended, available to us in Georgia, I would argue, now. In these cases, you either put the child on the stand or you don't get the statement in. I also think um, that in uh, Rule our current Rule 807, our, our version of the, uh, of the uh, residual hearsay exception, says a statement not specifically covered by any law, which means we can't use it in cases of child hearsay because we have Rule 820 out there. It's covered by another law. So we can't say, oh, well, we're, just, we're, we're coming under 807 and not 820 in this case because 807 wouldn't apply. But if we replaced it with the language of the federal rule, that it was any statement not specifically covered by 803 or 804, which for us are substantially similar to the federal 803 and 804, we would get around that. And that's one of the things that bars our use of 807 right now. Because I asked, I asked uh, somebody at the Capitol uh, last year when I first started looking into this why we couldn't just get rid of Rule 820. And he just laughed and he said, well, it doesn't matter if it's a good law or a bad law. Everybody loves the child hearsay exception. And I said, well, what about the fact that it really arguably doesn't really protect children anymore? I mean, they've got to testify. And if they don't testify, we're not sure whether it comes in or not, whether the judge you know, can make a decision to keep it out or not. And we don't have unavailability, psychological unavailability ready for us or any of those things. And he said, you know, it's just, you're not going to get rid of the child hearsay statute because everybody loves it, you know. And if that's the case, you know, we could at least get rid of this language in Rule 807 that would give us an alternative to, uh, if we don't have the political will to get rid of 820, we could make 807 available to us this way. That's just a suggestion. And of course, the best suggestion of all, I think, uh, would be to get rid completely of our Rule 820. So, in considering the utility of Rule 820, I'd just like to get close to finishing by talking about why we have child hearsay exceptions anyway. Why do we even have them? 
And this is an excellent quotation from our Supreme Court in Bunn versus the state. It's quoting, the Bunn Court is quoting the, the case that it overruled, but in doing so, it's saying this stuff is right. This is so totally true. There are compelling reasons for allowing child victims hearsay statements to come into evidence, including society's desire to spare children, ensuring the jury hears the statement of a child who's been traumatized and is psychologically unable to recount, and to protect the rights of victimized children who can't defend those rights for themselves. So I mean, those are the traditional reasons for the existence of a child hearsay statute. But right now, as I pointed out, most of these are actually unavailable to us in Georgia. And it's funny to me that the Supreme Court in 2012, after the decision of Hatley, um, noted that psychological unavailability was one of the reasons for having a child hearsay statute. I mean, maybe they were saying, maybe they were hinting that maybe we need to get rid of this availability requirement. I don't know. But that's why we have them anyway. These are the rationales for child hearsay statutes. So my final pitch is that our child hearsay scheme now in no way furthers the ends of a child hearsay statute. Not only does it not work like a child hearsay statute, not only is there ambiguity about whether unobjected to child hearsay can come in, but it also doesn't further any of the ends of a child hearsay statute. Lastly, I'd like to make two quick considerations about the future of child hearsay under the 2014 Juvenile Code. I don't know um, how, what y'all's experience has been, but in the 20 years that I've been practicing law, I've heard this a bazillion times, and I've probably said it half a bazillion times, and that is, you know, let's say you're hearing a case, um, especially like a deprivation case, and one of the parties isn't there. You know, you've given them notice, hasn't shown up, didn't bother to come to court that day, and you've got a defects case manager on the stand testifying and saying, well, you know, I met with the father, and uh, he told me he had a drug problem. You get a objection, hearsay. And the constant response is, well, he's a party, right? And we all know that you can say anything that a party says in court. And you know, I don't even know if that was a rule of evidence under the Cobb Evidence Code under which we've lived in one form or another until uh, last year. But it certainly was constantly, in my experience, other people I've talked to and people I know, it's constantly done in courts. And I think things are very different in this respect under our new code. So the question that gets asked all the time now, I think, is, well, okay, if a child's going to be a party, do we really need to worry about a hearsay exception? Because isn't anything the child says just admissible as a party? which I think would be an unintended consequence of making a child a party, but it's a question that's worth asking because someone's going to ask it. So aren't these statements not hearsay? As far as I can determine under our current code by looking at federal precedent, there's really only a couple of ways you can get in a statement by a party. I don't believe that you can say anything that a party has said. I think it's very clear under our current code. So I think the answer first is uh, you, could, you could possibly get an admission by a party opponent because, um, in fact, under Rule 802, these aren't hearsay. Admissions by party opponents are not hearsay. Notice that's not 803 or 804. It's not one of the exceptions. An admission by a party opponent is not hearsay. But I think it's kind of hard to imagine. So an admission by a party opponent is not necessarily something that a party said to incriminate himself. It's anything that a party said outside of court, prior to court, which is then used against that party in court. Um, I think it's difficult to imagine um, when considering a statement by a child about sexual conduct or physical abuse. Um, it's hard to imagine in what sense the child's a party opponent. I mean, who, who's, who's the opposing party to the child? And it would require that the, the party who is opposed to the child be the one introducing the evidence. So if you've got a statement by a caregiver, a parent, um, a statement by a child implicating a parent or a caregiver, who's going to be introducing that? Not the parent or the caregiver. You're going to have the state attempting to introduce that. Are they opposed to the child? Are they party opponents to the child? So I don't think that would probably work to get us around the use of our hearsay statute. Um, the other common way uh, 
is one of those unavailability rules. Statements against interest find unavailable declarant. Get a declarant is unavailable. If he makes a statement against his interest, um, it can come in. Because it was so contrary to the declarant's interests. Well, I guess the question here would be, I think it's probably difficult to imagine a statement, uh, a circumstance like this, but let's go back to the fact, let's, let's tie up the beginning and the end of the presentation by going back to the fundamental liberty interest in family integrity. I'd love to see somebody make this argument that a child has a fundamental liberty interest in family integrity. He has um, a right not to have his family torn apart. And if he makes a statement that certainly a parent or a close family member has sexually or physically abused him, is that a statement that is remarkably against the child's interest? I mean, I think if you've dealt with children that make statements against parents and close relatives and caregivers, you see that it's, A, not easy for them to do so. It causes them a lot of guilt and stress and strain. And I think there's a, perhaps a creative argument to be made that if a child has a fundamental liberty interest in family integrity, that a statement that he makes that will damage the family, that will tear the family apart, that will harm the integrity of that family, um, is really arguably one that is, um, would have been made only if the person believed it to be true. So I don't know that. I don't know the answer under 804b3. I think that's a, that would be a creative argument for somebody to make that it would come in um, if the child was then psychologically unavailable or otherwise unavailable to testify because it's a statement that no one would make. I've actually found one case where this argument was made by the department and the appellate court um, made its um, ruling on another ground and never came back and addressed it. So somebody's made this argument. Um, once under our old Georgia code. Um, so it would be interesting to see it made again. And I think finally the thing that we have to realize about this is that we really haven't decided what it means for a child to be a party yet. So we don't really know um, whether statements by that child and under what circumstances statements by that child should come in like certain other party statements do. And if you doubt that we don't know how um, a child acts as a party in our state, then you can look at WLH, which was decided in 2013 before children were technically parties. They won't be until 2014 under our statutes. But is everybody familiar with WLH? So, right? So the, the Supreme Court of Georgia says, well, a child can't appeal by telling his attorney he wants to appeal. The guardian ad litem has to do it, which is you know, not the sort of thing that any other, it's not a burden that's on any other party. Any other party says to the attorney, you know, appeal, and the case gets appealed. So the Georgia Supreme Court has a lot of, I mean, if you read the, that case and you see this back and forth argument between the dissent and the majority, you find that there's a lot of disagreement on our Supreme Court about what it means for a child to have an attorney. And that's going to carry over into what it means for a child to be a party. So it remains to be seen how a child's status as a party is going to affect the introduction of previous statements by the child regarding sexual or physical abuse, I think. So that should wrap it up. That's the, 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 the statute, the background, the, um, the uh, Hatley case, uh, my arguments, my personal arguments uh, for the inefficacy of our current system, and some proposals for a way forward, which is essentially the adoption out and out of the federal rule 807, the residual exception. So any questions? Or questions, I should say? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much.